to imagine it now. But at the turn of the 19th century, Christmas was hardly celebrated, at least not in a way that you would recognise. Gift giving had traditionally been a New Year activity, but moved as Christmas became more important to us Victorians. And by the end of the century, Christmas had become the biggest annual celebration in the British calendar. Advancements in technology, industry and infrastructure, as well as having an impact on society as a whole, made Christmas an occasion that many more British people could enjoy. That's not to say that Christmas celebrations did not exist before, but it was mostly about feasting. Eating and drinking had been the major part of Christmas celebrations almost from the start. In the 4th century, the Bishop of Rome proclaimed that the 25th of December was to be the day of Christ's nativity. But less than three decades later, the Archbishop of Constantinople found it necessary to warn his flock against feasting to excess, and so it continued down the centuries. In a story written in 1837, Mr Charles Dickens ticked off the essentials to what makes a perfect Christmas day. Family, mistletoe and holiday, church going and charity, and of course food. Turkey, plum pudding and mince pies. But he makes no mention of trees, carols, cards, stockings or crackers. There's even no Father Christmas, nor are there presents. Dickens was on the cusp of the great changes that were coming. And when he began to write, many of the traditions from this traditional festival were evolving and new traditions were being created. And the transformation has happened quickly and has come for all people, be they rich or poor and those like me in the middle. You see, the greater mechanisation and widespread industrialisation of the country has helped to create a new middle class with a greater disposable income. More money means more things such as mass-produced toys, decorations and novelty items such as the Christmas cracker, inspired by bonbons, sugared almonds wrapped in twists of paper. Tom Smith saw them on a trip to Paris and he first invented the cracker in the 1840s. Some years later, while sitting by a fire, a crackling log startled Smith and gave him the idea to add the bang to his popular sweets. And once he perfected the explosive bang, the Christmas cracker became a popular seasonal staple. The gifts, or the sweets I should say, were replaced by small gifts and small trinkets such as whistles and miniature dolls to more substantial items like jewellery along with a joke and a paper hat. By 1900, 13 million Christmas crackers were being sold worldwide. And what about Christmas cards? <gasps> I so love to get those in the post. The first Christmas card was printed for a Disney businessman by the name of Sir Henry Cole, who just happened to be the first director of the B&A Museum in 1843. He commissioned the artist J.C. Horsley to design a festive scene. He chose a group of people sitting around a dinner table and put a cheery message inside. Cole had 1,000 printed and those he didn't use himself were sold on to the public. At a shilling each, these were very pricey for us ordinary Victorians and not everyone can afford them. However, the trend caught on and many children, including Queen Victoria's, are encouraged to make their own Christmas cards and they have an amazing range of images, which do not necessarily have a Christmas theme. There are flowers, jokes, stories and even chickens are popular. In this age of industrialization, of machines and factories, improvement in the chromolithographic printing process, by that I mean colour printing technology, has rapidly advanced, meaning the price of actually making the cards has dropped significantly. Together with the introduction of the halfpenny postage rate, the Christmas card industry has taken off. And by the 1800s, ascending of cards has become hugely popular, creating a lucrative industry that produced 11 and a half million cards in 1880 alone. And the first call, the first call to post early for Christmas was issued. The commercialization of Christmas is well and truly on its way. Now, the singing of carols is not new to us Victorians, but it is a tradition that we have revived and it is very popular. We consider carols to be a delightful form of musical entertainment and a pleasure well worth cultivating. Old words have been put to new tunes and the first significant collection of carols was published in 1833 for all to enjoy. 
But as I said earlier, Mr Dickens' first Christmas story makes no mention of carols. But only six years later, his most famous story was entitled A Christmas Carol, written in 1843. It was another decade before carol singing became widespread, because two things are necessary. Families need to be together, and there needs to be a way to play the music. For the former, the new railways made it possible for workers and children away at school to travel home for the holidays, although it was not until the 1870s when paid holidays were established for the first time that working people could take full advantage of this. And then advertising and instalment plans were making pianos more accessible to the middle classes for the first time. So, carol singing it is. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. With the angelic host proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. <laughs> my favourite part of Christmas is decorating my humble home, although it has become quite an elaborate affair. The medieval and shrewder traditions of using evergreens has continued. Ivy is the symbol for femininity, whilst holly is seen to be masculine. The combination of the two intertwined promise the household fertility for the coming year. Evergreens are strewn on the mantel place and wreaths or welcome rings consisting of holly, ivy, pine cones and ribbons are hung on the front door to welcome visitors. And the old custom of simply decking the halls and windows with sprigs and twigs is no longer fashionable. We like things to be far more organised than that. There are even instructions on how to make fancy artificial decorations for people who live in town who can't easily get hold of holly, ivy and mistletoe. In 1881, Cassell's Family Magazine gave strict directions to the lady of the house to bring about a general feeling of enjoyment, much depends on the surroundings. It is worthwhile to bestow some little trouble on the decoration of the rooms. I hope my small fare is satisfactory. The idea of an indoor Christmas tree originated in Germany, where Albert was born. In 1848, the Illustrated London News published a drawing of the royal family, celebrating around a tree bedecked with ornaments. And it caused such a flurry of excitement and interest that the custom quickly became fashionable. The popularity of decorated Christmas trees grew quickly and it came with a market for tree ornaments and bright colours and reflective materials that would shimmer and glitter in the candlelight. By 1860, the traditional Christmas tree was adorned with many traditional and unusual items, such as glass ornaments, decorative sweet containers, children's toys, flags, ribbons, sweets, baubles, nuts and homemade gifts. The trees are lit with candles, precariously balanced on the dry tree branches, they can be something of a fire hazard. But in America, they now have new electric lights, but they're very expensive and far beyond my means. One thing you could easily make for yourself is a paper chain. Just get some strips of paper, loop them together, and you have your own decoration. Did you know that in the 1890s, one Covent Gardener retail supplied trees up to 40 feet tall and boasted sales of 30,000 trees each year? The tree is a perfect place for the family to gather and Christmas is centred around the family. The preparation and eating of the feast, decorations, gift giving, entertainments and parlour games all are essential to the celebration of the festival and are to be shared by the whole family, as is the giving of gifts. This was traditionally done at New Year, but as Christmas became more important to us Victorians, it started to be done on Christmas Day. Fruit, nuts and small handmade trinkets are usually hung on the Christmas tree and are given out. However, as gift giving became more central to the festival, the gifts have become bigger and shop bought and they've been moved to underneath the tree. And what of food? As you may recall, plum porridge and and Twelfth Night Cakes served on the evening before Epiphany to mark the holiday season's end, hidden with a bee or a, pe a bean inside. 
whoever found those would be the king and queen of Twelfth Night. And both of these foods have gradually transformed into more traditional Christmas fare, plum pudding and Christmas cake. Meanwhile, somewhat bizarrely, we can thank the railways for altering the main course of the meal, which had traditionally been beef for those who could afford it. Before the railways, with their speedy transport, animals had been herded to market alive. Turkeys, however, are poor walkers. Their feet are tender, and they needed to be fitted with little leather boots to protect them on the march. Even so, a second fattening up period once they arrived was still necessary, which made them a luxury commodity. But with the arrival of trains, the price of turkeys has dropped, and their large size makes them perfectly for the equally large Victorian family. But there are, of course, many, many people who cannot afford a Christmas meal. And newspapers print Christmas appeals for donations for the poor, the sick and the elderly. And charitable organisations provide Christmas dinners for those in need. Even the workhouse provides some sort of Christmas fare and oranges are handed out to the inmates. And before we leave our Victorian Christmas, we have missed out one very important man. Father Christmas himself, the symbol of the festive season who has been around for centuries and who has appeared in various forms. He starts as Saint Nicholas, a fourth century bishop who lived in Turkey and was famous for his acts of kindness, especially towards children. One day, on hearing that a poor man was reduced to selling his three pretty daughters as slaves, Nicholas threw three purses of gold through the door. On another occasion, he threw some gold coins down a chimney and they fell into a stocking which had been left out to dry, although some say a shoe. And it is this that is the origin of our Christmas stockings. And in Germany, shoes are left by the door and filled with gifts. After St Nicholas' death, it became custom to give presents in secret on his feast day on the 6th of December. St Nicholas eventually came to Holland, where he was known as Sinterklaas. The children's saint was accompanied by his faithful sidekick, Black Peter. Peter kept careful notes about each child in his book, and he decided who on the 6th of December should receive gifts and who should be chased with a large stick. Santa Claus is American. His name is a mispronunciation, I can't even say the word, a mispronunciation of Sinterklaas. His classic appearance comes from Clement Moore's well-loved poem, The Night Before Christmas, which was first published in America in 1823. He was dressed all in fur from his head to his foot, and his clothes were all tarnished with ashes and soot. A bundle of toys he had flung on his back, and he looked like a peddler just opening his pack. His eyes, how they twinkled, his dimples, how merry. His cheeks were like roses, his nose like a cherry. His droll little mouth was drawn up like a bow, and the beard on his chin was as white as the snow. He had a broad face and a round little belly that shook when he laughed like a bowl full of jelly. He was chubby and plump, a right jolly old elf, and when I saw him I laughed in spite of myself. His business day was moved too to Christmas Eve instead of the 6th of December, St Nicholas Day, and by the 1820s he had his sleigh and reindeer. By 1870 he customarily wore a bishop's red robes, and by the late 1880s he melded with old Christmas in Britain to become Father Christmas, part of the home-based domestic holiday and a symbol of giving. After the fun of eating, drinking and gifts, there is one more treat in store. For on Boxing Day, the pantomimes open and the mixture of song and dance and acrobatics is enjoyed by children and adults alike. And it is something that I think will become a tradition at Christmas tide. Well, my dears, it is time for me to go and enjoy my own Christmas. And remember, that while Mr Dickens did not invent the Victorian Christmas, his book A Christmas Carol certainly helped to make it popular and spread the traditions of the festival which I imagine you enjoy today. Its themes of family, charity, goodwill, peace and happiness encapsulate the true spirit of the Victorian Christmas, which I hope you will continue to enjoy in your homes this Christmas tide. <laughs>